welcome Steamboat Christian Center to Church Online. As you can see, you can watch church anywhere in any day of the week. Church Online brings people together. I'm right here, plane's coming by, but that's okay. I'm right here at the Yampa River because August 16th, we are having our annual baptisms at the river. It is gonna be unbelievable. Now, here's the thing. Maybe over the last few months, you've been going through some trials and, and things and you've really come closer to God and you've gotten better in your relationship with Christ. Maybe you're new to this faith walk. Well, your next step is baptism. What baptism is, it is an inward feeling of an outward expression that you are here and you are following Jesus and you're telling everybody we're doing it a little bit differently. We want you to sign up at the link below and we are going to be having slots where you can bring your family and your friends and we're going to give you a personalized video that you can share with the entire world. It's going to be great. Also, uh, our Steamboat Kids is giving away bicycles for you to be a blessing for someone else. Through your generosity, we have been able to purchase a lot of bicycles and we want to be a blessing. We want you to be a blessing for someone else. So email Hadley at the link below and that way we can give you some bicycles so you can go give them to your neighbors and to your friends and to some of your family members. And also, last but certainly not least, we are having August 30th, our annual Neighbor Day. If you want to be a part of it, email me at the link below. We're going to be having new iHeart Steamboat shirts. We're going to be going out into our community, going out into your neighbor, your neighborhoods, and serving and helping your neighbors. It's going to be unbelievable. At a time like this, right now in our world, I think that our church needs to be the church and go out in our community for Neighbor Day, August 30th from 1 to 4 p.m. Well, that's it for me. I'll see you next week. We love you. Hey, it's week three of this series we are doing called Better. And uh, today we're talking about the end of the story for Joseph, how God fought for him and freed him. And so today we're gonna sing a new song that talks all about that, how God led the people of Israel out of Egypt, parted the sea so they could walk through it and gave them a new life. And I can imagine that there's a lot of you out there who are facing some hard things. And we just want to remind you that God can lead you out of your Egypt. And he can march you into freedom too. And he's fighting for you today. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance and the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, he'll back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me. Fire by night, it's the guiding light to my feet. But you find me, you free me, we'll back the waters for my release. Oh, yeah. Oh,
Over the last few months, I think we've all been kind of secretly hoping that things would get back to normal soon, right? But um, I think the challenge with that is, is that to go through all of this pain without getting any gain sure would be a shame, right? And so we've been asking ourselves over the last couple of weeks a question. And the question is, how can we be better for this? How can we be better uh, for all of the adversity that we've been going through? I mean, uh, when you think about it, one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, you and I uh, look up to certain people, one of the reasons that we respect the people that we respect is, is their ability to respond to adversity, right? The people that we look up to are those people who, who, who have risen above the challenges that they've been confronted with, who, who have been able to walk through the fire and not been, be burned, you know, who have been able to, to go through life and, and have been hurt by people but haven't turned around and hurt people themselves. Those are the people that we look up to. And what they have done is, is that they have used their superpower, right? They've used their superpower rather than react to the negative circumstances in their life, they have learned to respond to them. And as such, they have gotten better for what they've gone through. I believe this, write this down, that a good response, a wise response, a thoughtful response has the power to turn any negative situation that you and I are going through completely around. I, I definitely believe that. But here, here's the catch. The reason that you and I don't always respond well to uh, circumstances or situations is because it doesn't really come natural to us. Yeah, uh, uh, reacting and, and freaking out and lashing out at people comes naturally. That's the easy thing to do, but it often makes things worse for ourselves, right? Um, we lose control of our lives. We, we sometimes even sabotage our destinies. Speaking of destiny, 
Um, last week, we read the first half of a story by uh, Joseph from the Old Testament. You might remember Joseph, one of my favorite characters. And his story, better than any other story I've read, illustrates the course-reversing, pain-redeeming power of a good response. Like you and I, Joseph didn't know how his story would end up, right? But early on in his life, Joseph made the decision to choose to respond rather than react to his situations. Now, his life by no means was easy. I mean, he went through a lot of stuff. In fact, if Joseph had a resume, it would read a lot like a Greek tragedy, right? It would be Joseph Jacobson, uh, kidnapped once by his brothers, sold twice into slavery. Then he was framed and then imprisoned indefinitely for a crime that he didn't even commit. Not a great life. It was a miserable life that he lived. And when we left Joseph last week, um, uh, Joseph was rotting away in a prison cell. I mean, no one was out there looking for Joseph. And worse than that, it seemed like no one was even looking out for Joseph. And maybe right there, that sounds a little familiar to you. Maybe you feel like you're in a pit right now. And you don't feel like anyone is out there looking for you or looking out for you. I'll tell you what, here's the key for Joseph. Joseph responded to his bad luck as if God was actually with him and would ultimately one day restore him. Joseph had a knack to believe that God was with him and that God would one day fix everything in his life. He believed that. And that brings me to a question that I want to ask here before we get into the story, and that is this. How would someone in your circumstances right now, how would someone in your circumstances respond if they were confident that God was with them? I mean, how would you respond to the problems that this COVID-19, this pandemic has brought into your life if you believed that God was doing something behind the scenes to bless you in a way that you couldn't imagine? Would you act a little differently? Would you talk a little differently? Would you walk around a little differently? I think so. And so with that in mind, I want to read the rest of Joseph's story to you today. Following a, a false rape accusation, Joseph's master, we saw this last week, has got a guy named Potiphar, puts Joseph in prison. And in Genesis chapter 39, verse 20, we pick up the story. It says this, that Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where Pharaoh's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, here it is again, the Lord was with him. <laughs> I, I, it's just so strange how the Bible kind of puts these two ideas almost in the same sentence. I mean, think about it. While Joseph is, is, it was, had been unfairly and was being unfairly punished for committing a crime that he didn't do, the Bible says with a straight face that God was with him. <laughs> I mean, it blows my mind. And, and it's these kind of situations that cause you and I to kind of sometimes look up into the sky and say, God, where are you? I mean, you said that you would never leave me or forsake me, but where are you? Here I am right now suffering for something that I didn't cause. I mean, I'll tell you, God, it, 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 you say that you're with me, but it sure doesn't feel like you're with me, much less even before me right? Uh, the text goes on. It, it says this in verse 21. It says that God showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. <laughs> Again, we kind of assume that if, if God's favor is on your life, if God's favor is with you, then things are going to be great for you. You're not going to have any problems. You definitely aren't going to have a relationship with a prison warden, right? That's not going to be in your life, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just positive that there, there were times in Joseph's life that he kind of just thought, you know what? I wish, God, you would go and be with someone else for a change, right? I just wish you would go over and be with maybe my brothers for a little while or be with Potiphar's wife for a while because I could sure use a break from all this favor that's coming my way right now. Well, anyway, so months and years go by 
And Joseph endures his life in prison. He's not going anywhere. I mean, the story kind of comes to a complete halt there. I mean, he's not getting time off for good behavior. Um, There's definitely no hope for him that he would ever be free from this situation. And then, due to some circumstances that are unrelated to Joseph, the Pharaoh has a falling out with two of his officials, um, the baker and his cupbearer. I don't know what they did, but boy, they upset him, and he puts them in prison with Joseph. And in Genesis chapter 40, verse 4, we read what happens. It says that the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and Joseph attended to them. And after they had been in custody for some time, one night they each had a disturbing dream, each with its own specific interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled, and he asked them, Hey, why are you guys so sad today? And they said to him, we have had dreams, but there is no one that can interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Now this is just classic Joseph, right? He's just happy-go-lucky, acting like everything's good. He's still believing, still trusting in a God that hasn't done anything for him. He's still responding instead of reacting to his situation. And so the cupbearer, he tells him his dream first. And Joseph kind of smiles and and tells him the good news. He says this in verse 13. He says, in three days, here's what's going to happen. Pharaoh is going to come and he's going to lift up your head and he's going to restore you back to your position. And then Joseph says something that kind of proves that he is in fact human. I mean, up to this point, his actions have made almost no sense to you and I as we've read this story. But this story makes, this, this line makes him human. It says this in verse 14, Joseph said, but when all goes well with you, please remember me and show me some kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews and even here I have done nothing to deserve being in this prison. Think about that. Uh, Because Joseph never once complained about the injustices and the sufferings that he endured, you and I might assume that it, it didn't really bother him, that he was okay with it all. That's just fine, bring it on. But this plea proves that he had some strong feelings about some of the things that had been done to him and that he wasn't immune to the pain, that he was in fact human and could hurt. But here again is the difference. Rather than react to his negative circumstances, Joseph always chose to respond to them. And so the baker's sitting there and he's listening to the conversation and he butts in. He's like, hey, it's my turn now. Please tell me what my dream means. And so Joseph says, go ahead. And he tells Joseph the specifics of his dream. When he finishes... um, Joseph kind of shakes his head and looks at him and says, man, uh, that's a tough one. I, I don't really know. I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't interpret that one for you. No, that's not what he said. That's what he should have said because what he did say was brutal. Listen to this. He looked at the baker and he says, here's what your dream means. Instead of lifting your head and pulling you out of prison, in three days, Pharaoh is going to cut your head off and he's going to impale your body on a pole. Yeah, and if if that's not bad enough, some birds of the air are going to come and they're going to eat your flesh off of your hanging body there. Yeah, have a nice day. Would anyone else like to have their dreams interpreted? Because I'm ready to go. This is crazy, right? The point is, is that just as Joseph predicted, three days later, the baker was taken out and beheaded, but the cupbearer was restored back to his original position. Now, as you might imagine, Joseph is filled with hope and anticipation. I mean, he's thinking, finally, I'm going to get out of this hellhole that I've been in. And every time he hears footsteps outside his prison cell, he's, he starts gathering his things together and putting, grabbing all of his stuff because he's sure that the cupbearer is going to go and, and plead his case to uh, Pharaoh on his behalf. But that doesn't happen. In verse 23, it tells us, It says, but the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. God, once again, uh, more bad luck, more injustice, and more disappointment for Joseph. And now two long years go by. Two years. And Joseph is now about 30 years old. 
He's, he's not a kid anymore. He's, he's a middle-aged man in that society, and he has been stuck in prison for about a third of his entire life. And every morning, Joseph is waking up with the realization that time is running out, that, that the opportunity for him to have a life of significance, to have a, a, just a normal life, a life of peace, is becoming increasingly slim. And then something interesting happens. Pharaoh himself has a disturbing dream. And he calls in all of his magicians and, and all of his priests, and none of them can interpret it. None of them know what, knows what it means. And finally, um, finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. He, he, he turns to Pharaoh and he says, hey man, do you remember a couple years ago when we weren't getting along and you threw me in prison? While I was down there, I met this young Hebrew guy and, and I had a dream and I told him what the dream was and he interpreted and it came true, just like he said. And so it says this in Genesis chapter 41, uh, verse 14, that Pharaoh then sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he'd shaved and he had changed his clothes, he stood there before Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to him, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, what Joseph says next are perhaps maybe the most courageous words that he've ever, he's ever spoken in his life. I mean, think about this. Remember, Joseph is a foreigner in a foreign land and he is standing before a very violent and uh, temperamental king. I mean, this guy just cuts people's heads off on whatever whim, right? And even though um, God was with Joseph, God hadn't done much for Joseph in a long time. But Joseph takes a step of faith. He looks Pharaoh in the eye and in verse 16, he says this, I cannot do it. I cannot interpret your dream. It's not me that can do it. But God, but God will give the answer that Pharaoh desires. Now, here's the problem with that statement. Um, Pharaoh believed that he was God. Pharaoh was God. For all intents and purposes, he was God on earth. And he's thinking and listening to this. He's like, where does this guy get off thinking that his pitiful, stupid little Hebrew God is more powerful than the God of Egypt, which is the most powerful nation on earth? This is crazy. This is a huge risk that Joseph has taken here. But fortunately, Pharaoh was more curious than offended by that question. And so he tells Joseph his dream. He tells Joseph what he dreamed about and Joseph then explains it to him. He predicts to him that for the next seven years, Egypt is going to go through a time of abundance, that they're going to have great harvests one after another every year. But after seven years, there's going to be followed by seven years of famine. A deep, deep famine is going to come upon the world. And then Joseph makes the bold move of telling Pharaoh how he should prepare for this. He encourages him to appoint someone that can handle taking care of this project. He needs to find someone that's wise that can handle this project. Well, Pharaoh kind of takes the bait, and in verse 39 it says this, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all of this known to you, and since there is no one so discerning and wise as you, you shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are, sub are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Now, Joseph listens to this, and I can imagine him going, yeah, right. <laughs> That's exactly what Potiphar told me before he ruined my life. But none nonetheless, rather than let his past or let his trauma that he had had in his life uh, cause him to be cynical, Joseph responds to this opportunity with the same mindset as he always did. He asks himself the question, what if, what if God is with me? What if um, God wants to use this situation to make me better? It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And so in one day, in one day after 30 years of just misery. Uh, in one day, Joseph goes from the prison all the way to the palace. He goes from the prison cell to the penthouse, right? In one day, all of Joseph's miseries have been wiped away by an incredible unforeseen blessing. 
Now, Joseph, he does his thing, of course. He, he works as if everything depends on him. He's diligent. He's responsible. But he also knows that everything is depending and hinging on God. The Bible says that he buys up all the grain that he can. He buys up such a large amount of grain that it, it resembles the sand on the seashores, okay? Pretty crazy. And then he begins to build storehouses in all of the cities in Egypt to safe keep the grain, right? And then after seven years, the rain stops and nothing grows and a famine hits the world with a vengeance, Joseph then opens up the storehouses and he gives grain to the Egyptian people. Neighboring nations are also suffering and they hear about this and they begin to come from a long ways away so that they can buy grain from Egypt. And this is where the story takes an interesting twist. Joseph's father, we talked about him last week, Jacob, right? Joseph's father, who is living up in a land that would one day become known as Israel, he's up there. He learns that there's grain for sale down in Egypt. And so in Genesis chapter 42, verse 1, it says this. Jacob says to his sons, get this, he says, why do you guys just keep sitting around looking at each other? <laughs> just a kind of a sarcastic statement. I think there's a hint that Jacob is still a little upset with these guys for letting their brother be killed all those years, many earlier. But anyway, he goes on. He says, why are you guys sitting here looking at each other? I have heard that there's grain down in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Now, if you've read this story, you know that you know what happens next. You've heard this. Um, and it's fascinating. The actor's fortunes in this story are completely reversed now. Everything has turned upside down. 23 years ago, his brothers sold him into slavery and Joseph endured a lifetime of tragedy, heartbreak, and frustration. And now he is the second most powerful person in the entire world. He is at large and in charge, baby. He is in charge of this thing. It's totally flipped upside down. But the ultimate test of his superpower is now just beginning. Because when he sees his brothers, when he meets his brothers again, the question is, will Joseph react or will he respond? Now, I know what I would do if I was in his shoes. Oh man, I'd make these boys pay, not just for the grain, but I'd make them pay for every one of the things that they did, all that pain and suffering that they caused in my life. That's what I would do. Let's look at what Joseph says. Here's the big finale. In Genesis 42, verse six, it says that no, Joseph was the governor of the land. He was the person who sold grain to the people. And so when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to not know them. Now, this is interesting. Um, Joseph instantly recognizes them, and I'm, and I'm sure seeing them just brought back this flood of memories into his mind. I'm, I'm sure that Joseph remembered the terror of being beat up and thrown into a dark pit, right? I'm sure that he begins to remember the humiliation as he, as, that he felt as he stood there naked on the auction block as slave traders haggled over his value, right? I'm sure, I'm po positive that he remembered the 20 years of lonely and hopeless nights that he endured in that prison. He remembers all of that. And yet, it's clear from the story that Joseph is torn um, the Bible says that he, he, he pretends that he doesn't know him. And I think it's because he doesn't know what to do right now. He's not sure how to handle this situation. And, 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 and it's brilliant. His instincts, his emotions, his sense of justice must be shouting on the inside of him. Make these guys pay. They deserve to die. Kill him now. But against all of that, Joseph does the one thing he always does. He pauses he reflects, and then he responds. Wow. He clears the room of everybody that's in it except for just him and his brothers. And then he looks at them, and then he begins to weep through sobs and tears. He says to them in verse uh, 3, he says, I am Joseph. It's me. 
<laughs> of course, they can't believe their eyes. And then he asks them the question that he's probably asked himself a thousand times. He's like, is my father still alive? Is he still living, right? And the Bible says this. It says that his brothers were unable to answer him because they were terrified being in his presence. That's, that's such an interesting phrase because they didn't need to be terrified in his presence. Because in their absence, Joseph had chosen to live his life as if God was always present. That's who he was. And so when it counted the most, Joseph did it again. He responded as if God was with them. And he forgave his brothers. Oh, verse 4, he says, come close to me. I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me here ahead of you. Wow. I, I, I got to pause here to point something out because this is a brilliant, brilliant statement. Um, look at this. When you and I are able to respond as if God is with us. What happens is you and I are able to get a perspective on our situation that we would have never been able to get any other way. When you and I stop and think God is with me, it causes us to look at our situation, not through our eyes, but through His eyes. And we get such a different perspective on the whole situation. Look at what Joseph says. He says, it's okay, guys. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The reason I am here, the reason that I have gone through all of that suffering, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. No, the reason that I went through everything I went through was because God had a plan. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's not a plan that I ever would have wanted, man. I mean, I was sold into slavery twice. I was 20 years in prison, man. No way would have I ever picked that plan. But God allowed some of these bad things to happen to me so that in the end, I could save many lives. What a perspective. What a brilliant perspective. And here's the thing. What nobody knew then and wouldn't know for another 2,000 years was that God's plan was so much bigger than just saving Joseph and his brothers and his family. Do you remember Last week, we talked about God's plan to bless the entire world through one man, Abraham. Remember that? That God made a promise to Abraham and said, through your children, through your seed, I will bless this entire world. And I talked about how that plan, this huge plan that God put together, hung by a single thread. Uh, this thread was Joseph's ability to respond. Joseph's respondability. And now, standing in a room in front of his 12 brothers who would one day become the 12 tribes of Israel, which would one day become the nation of Israel, which would one day produce the Messiah who would save the world. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years after Joseph did this, the Messiah would do for the world what Joseph did for his brothers that very day. He would forgive them and he would save them. Wow. That's why I will say it again and again and again and hope that you never forget. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of a good response. You have no idea what is hanging in the balance in your life or in the life of your family or in the life of your world based on your response to your difficult circumstances. You'll never know. So the story ends this way. Joseph then brings his entire family down to Egypt, including his father, and he provides a place for them. He blesses them. And when his father, Jacob, finally dies a few years later, the brothers become afraid. They become afraid that Joseph is going to finally take retribution on them. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 18, it says this, that his brothers then came to Joseph and they threw themselves down before him and they said, we are now your slaves. 
Not surprisingly, Joseph again responds to them instead of reacts. In verse 19, Joseph said to them, don't be afraid of me. I have no right to change what God has decided. And then he makes one of the most brilliant, amazing statements in the entire Bible. We, we started with this last week and I want to end with it today. He said in verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What you did to bring me harm, God has used to make me better. What an amazing statement and what an amazing story. And this is not just Joseph's story. This is our story. God has given this to us as a gift for such a time as this. And I pray that you will let this get down in your heart. And I pray that you will ask this question and you will live with this question. And that is, is God, how could I respond to my situation if I believed that you were with me? How would I respond differently to the circumstances that are happening to me right now if I believed that you were behind the scenes pulling levers and connecting the dots between this pain and this tragedy in my life and bringing about my good? What would I do differently? How would I live differently? It will make all the difference. The point I'm trying to say is that our respondability gives us the opportunity to be better for it regardless of what it is. I know that we didn't choose this pandemic. I know that we didn't choose it. But our response to it will determine whether we will be better for it. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you as we, we close this series. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the trials and tribulations that I've gone through in my life. I look back now and I see them and I see how you use them, how you use them to grow me, how you use them to reposition my life, to put me in the right place at the right time for the next opportunity. And now I am grateful for those trials and tribulations and I rejoice in the journey that you have taken me through. And now, God, as I look at the current situation and I'm afraid and I'm worried and I'm looking at this and, and I don't know what's going to happen next, I remind myself that you are with me, that you have a plan for me, that you have not left me, you have not forsaken me, but you will get me through this thing and that on the other side of this, I'm going to look back and see that things are better, that you made them better, that you had a plan and a purpose in my pain. I thank you for that. I pray that you will help me see it. And I pray that you would help our church walk through this with that kind of confidence that God is with us. I believe these things and ask for these things. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen. You're